name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we look to encounter you in our hearts. Help us to feel your stirring there. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to <clears throat> know the things that you would have us do would be pleasing to you. Lord, uh, enlighten us in terms of the particular quandary that we find ourselves in. Help us to know the appropriate decision, the course of action that you would have us take with respect to the things that you know. Lord, we ask that you would help us not to dissipate our energy in empty and vainless activity. Help us, Lord, to, to hunger for righteousness, for holiness. Lord, we pray for those that you've placed in our lives. We pray for their particular struggles and their needs. Lord, we truly know that we can do nothing for them apart from what you enable us to do. Therefore, we lift their names up before you and ask for your profound grace to visit them and to alter and to heal, to change their minds and hearts. Lord, we especially approach this evening with, with excitement and anticipation wondering what we might learn, what we might have revealed to us that will open another passage in our path to growth. We anticipate all these things in anticipation set up worship to you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, I'm happy to see you all. Thank you for coming tonight. Louis and Catherine, welcome from Thank you. Illinois. We're very cold. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm glad you're here. As always, um, I anticipate a wonderful evening. We're going to have fun. It's a challenge to consider in, in the Word of God because there are so many nuances and hidden messages that if we dig a little deeper, that they'll begin to kind of float to the top of the text, and we'll be able to apply them to our Christian life and our Christian discipline. And I really want to say, the Christian life is really a disciplined life. It is kind of doing things in a structured way. It's doing your prayers when you get up. Learning to discipline your day. Or that you give God your first offering. And in like fashion, as you transition to activities in your car, you learn to bless yourself as you travel. And you learn to sign yourself with God's protection. And similarly, as you're encountering people along the way, that you're mindful as to what God would have you do for them. Have you noticed sometimes how you have run into people who look like people you really know? Have you wondered why God does that? That maybe you're supposed to pray for them? You know, and that he uses those contexts to remind you to pray for certain people? You know, and I wouldn't be surprised if these people actually change their appearance after you leave. You know, God uses situations and variables you know, to awaken us as to what the next task is. And this is the, what is truly exciting about the spiritual life is that these things are happening moment by moment. Your whole life is unfolding before you. And the excitement is as to what God will, will bring about next. What person will cross your path? What person will have a need that, that he will come or she will come before you to ask for your help? And you'll be dumb, and you say, well, well, why me? And they'll say, well, because you seem to be, you know, a pious person. He said, and you, before you never thought you were. Well, I didn't think I was. You know? <laughs> but, you know, but maybe you're having an impact upon others that you're not even aware of. And so we have to be kind of cognizant that, you know, there are a lot of things that are happening that God's doing in us and with us that we're perhaps not aware of. And maybe that's good, because if, if we knew we probably our pride would start to inflate, and then we'd actually think we're something when we're not. And so the key thing about the Christian life is to maintain the path of humility and diverse to God, always giving glory to God in all things. And if you give glory to God in all things, you can't, go, you can't get off track. God will keep you under it. He'll realize that, that you're not looking to somehow make up for some deficiency in your person where you need love. And so therefore, you're creating this attention so that others will notice you. You know, that's not the goal of a Christian life, is to look for attention. In fact, the closer one gets to God, 
this person tries to actually hide from attention. And this is the actual, the normal path of sainthood, is to seek to become truly anonymous, to live in the world and not really be known. You know, and, and truly that is something for us to um, emulate as we try to uh, find our way and navigate towards the path that God would have for us. Okay, with this in mind, we're going to continue with the verse that we left off with at the conclusion of last week, which is verse 16. And so I'm going to kind of reintroduce the first couple of questions again to get us on track as we continue our journey. In verse 16, we hear St. Paul say, Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Now, is the Christian life to be one of constant joy. And this is a question I posed at the conclusion of last week. Is the Christian life to be one of constant joy? Inner joy. Okay, inner joy, okay. That's, that's a fair response. What else? Is it to be a life of constant joy? No. Okay, George says no. Joe's kind of nodding. I think he's preparing to take a nap. Yeah. I don't know yet. <laughs> you don't know yet? He's fine. Okay. He's not sure. He's like, and so he hasn't cast his vote yet. What do you think? Is the is Christian license to be a one of constant joy? Mm -mm. Okay. No? Okay. And, uh, okay, so, well, the answer, actually, the correct answer is no. But but what what can a Christian realistically expect from life? No. Trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations. Yeah. Peace of mind. Huh? Peace of mind. Okay. I mean, what, can the both coexist? Trials and tribulations yes, and peace of yes, mind? Yes. You can actually have both yes. at the same time. Yes. Okay, and so that's really the key of life is learning to have that. Right. And actually that's 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 really the the paradigm or the example of a saint is that the world is falling apart around them. You know, people are running into each other. I was walk I was um, walking down the street in Chandler a week ago and, and uh, I was getting my car repaired and at the intersection 20 feet from me, three cars collided at the same time oh. into each other. Somebody had ran a red light, and a truck was pulled out going mm -hmm. across the smaller side of the street, and boom, and then the person that hit the truck spin around hit another car that was waiting to turn left. And uh, all this happened 20 feet before me, you know? And glass was flying everywhere, you know? The, and the, uh, but how fortunate they have to have the priest there to pray. Yeah, to well, I them. did. I even offered to help, but Gosh. I think the woman was trying to just speak in Spanish and was talking to somebody on the cell phone like that. <laughs> <laughs> arriba, arriba, arriba. You know, and, you know, and I was just, uh, and so I felt, I felt bad, but I prayed. I stayed for a little bit, and then I continued my journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you know, no, why was I there? Why did that happen? You know, why was I supposed to be present? And those are the things that you need to ask yourself. Why did I experience that? What was my role? What am I supposed to do? You know, and so all these things came to the forefront. And I think maybe that was to be a common influence, to be prayerful, and at least offer help, listen, at the moment, at least, you know, help was, was present. And, um, and then I continued. And, and um, did I feel threatened? Um, for a moment, as the thing happened so quickly, it was like it was a surreal moment where everything kind of in slow motion. You see all this kind of stuff. You know, the, the explosion, the glass, the spinning, the side impact, and then, uh, then the debris coming off the bumpers, you know, as the bumpers are unraveling, rolling towards the edge of the, you know, the pavement. You're just kind of looking, why? It's another day. Okay. But you continue. You continue. Okay. So, life is mixed with both joys and sorrows. There's this constant um, tug of war where both are present. Where you have this, this sustaining joy, and yet there's this other element that's constantly there. Kind of n nagging you know, picking at you. you know, and, and so, and that's kind of the constant theme of life on earth is that there's, there's this constant unfinishedness that we're, all, we're always going through or being cycled through. And so, 
if you if you are experiencing that, you know, don't be dismayed. Don't 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 allow yourself to feel depressed or despairing. And God will give you those momentary reprieves where you'll have you know some quiet time where there'll be nothing, and you'll have a a chance to kind of refresh. He does provide those things when he sees that you need it. God provides these opportunities. So just kind of you know, take note of that. So uh, why is there sorrow in life? Why is there sorrow? What do you think? Why is there sorrow in life? You're sorrowful when someone in your family dies or goes okay. away. Okay, okay. Or in death. Okay, Sometimes. so there's sorrow because things happen. What else? Because of the fall of nature. Yeah, because mm -hmm. of the fall of Adam. Okay, because everything is thrown out of kilter. Did you want to add to that, Brandon? I was going to say, are we, you mean like sorrow is in like bad things happen to us, they're like evil. That thing like free will. Both, both. Well, I think it's a matter of free will then. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think. We still choose to mm -hmm. deviate from our inner peace. Like if you choose mm -hmm. to not rely on the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's when you lose your inner peace. Okay, okay. So that's a good response. You know, so and it all it all kind of emanates forth from the primordial, you know, confusion resulting from the fall of Adam Eve because of original sin. Everything is put out of kilter. You know, the whole earth is out of kilter. You know, because of of the unsettledness of the creation. You have ebbs and flows of tidal patterns. The change in the changes of fluctuation of weather patterns cause the change of tidal patterns, cause the change of the platelets of the earth, and cause the you know the temperature variations underneath the earth would trigger volcanoes and such. So everything is thrown out of kilter because of the fall. And uh, and, and that's something we you have to consider. You know, earth is not heaven. It's been separated from heaven because of the original sin. You know, Adam and Eve were, were brought to outside of the gates of the Garden of Eden. There, and then there was the separation. And so you have to understand that the earth is not paradise now. It's, it's in a distorted, altered, you know, state. And because of that, you're going to have this constant ebbs and flows of weather fluctuations, tidal changes, you know, ninas and nino, el ninos and, and earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes and, you know, famine. And then you're going to have overgrowth in certain parts of the, of the planet. And so you have the full variety and change of everything. Everything is out of, is kind of out of the ebb and flow of of the calmness and the smoothness of tranquility of paradise. Everything's affected because of the fall of Adam and Eve. But sorrow produces repentance, Second Corinthians. Yes, yeah. Sorrow, and that's why, you know, the, the state of the earth is to remind us of, of the fall. And when we were mindful of the fall, it should trigger repentance. We're gonna kind of get into that a little bit further too. So just something for us to think about. So because of the tragedy of the fall, modern man's failed experiment with freedom and its destructive consequences are all around us. And even our stewardship of the planet, you know, when we strip mine, when we, um, you know, exhaust limited resources, we're altering the course of, of the planet. And so we are responsible actually for the planet. In fact, I, I got mentioned before that our ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew is really a major proponent speaking out for, he's called the Green Patriarch. He's speaking for the, you know, trying to, to take care of our resources, especially the Black Sea, that becomes, which is filthy, you know, and the Bosphorus, and trying to take care of the water that God's given us and, and to preserve in those limited resources. So it's something we have to ponder as Orthodox Christians. The church is very sensitive to the planet. And we as Orthodox Christians need to realize that we have been given the stewardship of planet Earth. And that, with that comes a heavy responsibility. So, you know, when we look at the whole situation of man's experiment, experiment with free will, what emotions surface as we review this whole compendium of, of history and all the events 
that have occurred through each epic and chapter from the beginning to our present day. What emotion surfaces as we view all this and take it in? What do you think, Joe? I say sorrow. Sorrow. I agree. I think I think sorrow because you, you begin to see how the human experiment has gone awry. Man's experiment with his with his freedom, with his self determination. That was created. What is it created? Chaos. Wars. Wars. What else? A lot of material things, but not much else. Okay, material advancement, but you know the decrease of love, right? You know the lack of of concern for, you know for, uh, you know for, for for the more important things in life. You know the material is given more value than the actual, you know spiritual. And so we see the price tag because what is it done to the family unit? Okay, yeah, it's divided in the start of the family unit. You know how is it affected? Mankind's well-being, his his yeah. psyche, his soul. How has it affected him? If you place a man in a material world and don't give him a faith foundation, He's you have a you have a breeding ground for mental illness. Yes. And likewise, when we mistreat the planet, the planet will mistreat us and the foods that we eat, and then we experience disease, and we, then we experience infirmities. And so we're all impacted, you know, uh, by these things. So one of our, one of the most sobering things or lessons in our Christian growth is, is to become aware of the tragedy of the human fall and to enter a state where we kind of em, empath emphatically feel sorrow for the choice of every human being. And we enter a responsibility for that. And we say, I too am responsible for every sin because I too have mimicked and followed the same script as my fellow humanity. And therefore, I feel the need to repent for all the sins. Of the world. And this is, the, this is actually, you know, the, um, the epic, I mean, the, the pinnacle of sainthood is to embrace the sins of the world as your own and to repent for the entirety of human failure. And when you can identify with every human person their failure, then you love all men the same. And that's the goal of the Christian life, is to reach this, this point where you love everybody, even the Jeffrey Dahmers and the Son of Sam's and, and uh, the Ted Bundys and the serial murders and those who have you know, perpetrated the most heinous of crimes when you can love them and separate the sin from them and say, you know, I love them, but I can see the tragedy of, of the human failure. Um, then you're knocking on the door of sainthood when you can do that on a regular basis. You feel your heart show the spirit of repentance and say, I'm sorry for them. I'm sorry for the world. And that's something we should pray for. Lord, give me a sense of repentance for the entirety of the human failure. And uh, a wonderful gift. Okay, so we, we sorrow over our own human failure and that of our fellow human, humanity. So with this, with this presence of sorrow, how is one able to avoid turning to despair? We get just horribly depressed. I mean, Father, you know, I come to the Bible study and I'm going to leave here clinically depressed tonight, you know, you know. I mean, you know, you know how am I going to avoid not being depressed, you know? You know, I mean, going down, I'm going to feel like I'm just, you know, I've got a dose of negativity that's going to last me a year. You know, what am I, how do I prevent that? What am I going to do to prevent despair and dejection from kind of putting their claws into me and not, not letting me go? What do I do? What do you think? In God's hands. Josephine? I know that God loves me. Okay. And I count my blessings every day. Okay. When things don't okay. go my way. That's okay. what I do. Yeah. And actually, Andre answered my question earlier. How do we respond? <laughs> repentance. Oh, yeah. Don't despair. Turn to repentance. And repentance. Now, repentance is not being a crybaby and sitting, you know, and just saying, yeah, I feel bad about the. No. What it is, repentance means it's kind of a sorrow, but a sorrow that moves one to do what. 
change. Okay, metanya. Yeah. Metanus. Okay, meta means change the noose. Change the spiritual mind. I shouldn't even point to the brain, because then you think that the noose is the brain. Okay, the noose, which is the, which is the cerebral part of the, the soul. It is the, it is the thinking component of the soul. But we are weak. We okay. ask repentance and we keep mm -hmm. doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So how do you get out of that vicious circle? Well, that's called, you know, a saint, the other course of Fotiki calls that the pain pleasure syndrome. Okay. <laughs> syndrome. Where, where it's because we prefer our way of life that we're in to actually change it. You know? I kind of like the people I'm with, even though they're bad for me. And so therefore, I will continue. I'll endure this pain pleasure syndrome. Oh. You know, and I'll go through, you know. And so what happens is you do the things that hurt, hurt you, and then uh, as a consequence, you feel good for it, and then you feel the pain. And then once the pain subsides, and you, you do the pleasure again, then the pain. And so it's, it's a kind of a, this vicious circle. Yeah. And the only way to break out is to change your thinking and say, I've had enough. You know, I'm tired of what's happening. You know, when I'm with this group of people, they make me sin. You know, I've had enough. You know, I prefer not to sin than their friendship. I need new friends. You know, I need um, I need new patterns. You know, if I you know if I'm going to go past this place that's sinful, you know, I'm going to have to take a different path. Mm -hmm. Go to the different. <coughs> you know, I have to make. You know, conscientious decisions that are going to avoid me from taking me to those places, or to that state of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, that leads to my, you know, spiritual debilitation. And so we have to ponder these things. So we have to, um, you know, we have to turn to repentance. And Saint Paul talks about the right way to approach our sorrow. And he does this in Second Corinthians uh, chapter seven, verse ten. Any, in fact, oh, I'm going to read that to you. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse ten: For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So there's two types of sorrow: a sorrow that leads to despair, and a sorrow that leads to repentance or change. Okay, and What's happened is, is um, God has given us a joy that will sustain us even though we're going through this change. We know we're, we're cognizant of God's love. We're cognizant that God's helping us. Even though we're going through this rough period of, of seeing our image being restored, our godly image. You know, it's like a, a car that's being, that's, that's being remodeled. You know, it, it has to be sanded. It has to be, you have to get the, you know, the, the dents have to be pounded out. And that's a, that's forceful action. It's it's painful for the structure of the car because it has to. You have to go against the very nature of of the form that's right. there, and that's why it's hard for us to kind of go through. You have to be patient as God is changing us. You know, you may have to go through a hard time as you're going through with the withdrawal of having to be with certain types of friends, the withdrawal of eating too much, the withdrawal of drinking too much, with withdrawal of sexual addiction. You have to go through this period of being dried out, you know, of, of this whole change of mind where, where no longer is your body dictating what you're going to do, but your soul, your noose, you know, the intellect now is calling the shots rather than the body. So that's where it talks about the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Mm -hmm. You have to turn yeah. yourself to the spirit. You know, you're trying, you're trying to change this big boat in the middle of a, of a small harbor. It takes time. So I don't care if you fall into the same sin over and over again for 10 years. But Father, you know, Jesus will come back and, and he'll, you know, I'll be in my sin. You know, what, do, what should I do? I, I'm going to give up. And this was a question that was asked by a, a monk to his abbot. And the abbot said, well, there's only one thing I request of you, that you continue repenting. And, and every time you fall off, repent. And then pray that if the Lord comes back, he, he finds you repenting. Okay. And that's what we have to do. Pray that the Lord finds us repenting. And, of course, you know, the key thing is, is that the way spiritual growth occurs is sometimes you have to go through human failure a number of times. And then, 
in order for you to give up. So, Lord, I surrender. You know, at the point where you surrender is when God steps in and says, "Okay, now let me show you how to do it." <laughs> okay, and then He takes over, and then you begin to see the breakthroughs. And then, but the Christian process is not always a straight line. You know, it's a it's not a static process where you stay at one place. It's dynamic. It's constantly changing. And you don't always go up in one direction. There's ups and downs, ebbs and flows, hills and dips, you know, low points and high points. That's just how life, spiritual growth is. And so if you're going through this, do not be discouraged. You know, don't be dismayed. Don't get down on yourself. Just get up. That's all the church wants you to do. Just get up, be humble, admit your sinner, confess your sin, and get going. <laughs> Keep going. Keep moving. And, um, and the only reason we fall is because we prefer our sin. We prefer certain things to, you know, to falling God completely. And so we're just trying to rid ourselves of that connection to our old fixations and things. It takes time. Be patient. So what does repentance accomplish? What does it accomplish? What is it? What does it accomplish? What does repentance accomplish? Reconnect with God. Okay, good point. Reconnect with God. Okay, we reconnect with God. It restores God's presence in us, and when that happens, it instills in us future hope. Oh Lord, I know there's hope. I can see green. I can see possibility. Before I was, I was locked in this prison. I couldn't see any way out. I couldn't see any way beyond my my addictive patterns and all of a sudden I see green light I see you know a beautiful panorama before me that wasn't there now all things seem possible you know I'm not locked in this box anymore of my limited thinking and my in the prison of my own you know passions you know then wonderful things start to happen and this is where you see the joy of the saints and the holy ones is that they've decided you know, to die. When you when people go to the monastery, and I've, I've mentioned this so often before, when you go to a monastery, you go there to die. You go there to die to what? Passions. Yeah, to the world. You know, to everything the world stands for. You know, you're preparing to take off to heaven. That's what the monastic, uh, you know, approaches. So they go there and, and, and cut their hair or whatever, and, and uh, you know, <laughs> leave their worldly clothing. They, they don this black, Garment, you know, to show the to show that the de detachment from, you know, from the joy of, of bright colors. And they're here to prepare, you know, uh, to repent for their sins so they can go to heaven. That's what they're doing. Somebody had their hand up over here. Okay, Aaron, just scratching your beard, mind. or I changed my mind. Okay, that happens too. You know? I change my mind all all the time. <laughs> Continuing. So it restores God's presence in us and instills in us future hope. Now, as a consequence, we feel the anticipatory joy. This is what emboldened the martyrs to face their martyrdom. Because they, they knew, they were assured in their faith of their relationship with God. And so they knew that although their martyrdom would be painful for a moment, that they'd be very quickly with, with God in paradise and that they would be immersed in the joy, being in the presence of the life-giving Holy Trinity. They knew this. It was palpable for them because they experienced in their in their prayer life. And the Christian tradition makes known to us that as one approaches martyrdom, they're given supernatural grace and boldness to face the task of martyrdom. Because in our human sense, we would cower before pain, any type of pain. And yet the Christian martyrs were given incredible courage to do things that were beyond human ability. Mm -hmm. And so that's what startled the masses as they witnessed the martyrdom, is how they could do the wonderful, courageous actions and endure, you know, the humiliation and, and the indescribable torments that they were subjected to. They were able to do so because of the infusion and operation of the Holy Spirit and the grace that God gave them to meet the challenge that was set before them. Mm -hmm. And I assure you that God will give each and every one of you the ability to stand before whatever task or challenge you have. Because you stand not alone, but you stand with God. I'll try to get it back on. 
task here in a moment. Okay, so, you know, it seems, you know, it seems so long for God, you know, to fulfill his future promises to us. You know, patience is a real struggle. It, how does God sustain us during our sojourn? Or how does he sustain us? You know, we go through these long intervals where nothing has happened. How does he sustain us? How does he sustain us and help us not reach the point of giving up? What do you think? Anybody over here? It's been quiet over here. Okay, so God knows, first of all, he knows what, what your capacity for pain, what your capacity for turbulence and commotion and upheaval, he knows what it is. But, you know, I'm at my wit's end. I'm at my, you know, sometimes your wit's end's a lot further than you think. <laughs> and sometimes you learn more about yourself through what you go through. So, well, in a million years, I never thought I could get through that. And then you look back and say, oh my gosh, you know, what I traversed that whole struggle that whole course you know so then we feel that with college courses we take mm -hmm. you know we get the syllabi we, we about swallow our tongue and say you know i can't read that many pages in a semester you know i can't write that many papers that many pages i can't do that i can't do that and and you know what happens is we we take it one piece at a time and somehow we get through it and, and it's done but how else does god sustain us during our sojourn or how else does he sustain us the sacraments. Huh? The sacraments. Sacraments. Okay, what else? Lent, great Lent. Great Lent, okay, what else? His word. His word, okay, his word sustains. What else? His beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Okay, encountering God in his creation, okay. The, the, God's the flowers grace. and everything. God's grace, okay. And, you know, I like to refer, you know, he, you know I like to refer to the many, um, let me call them many theophanies. You know that God sends us, and by theophany, that's a God manifestation, God appearance. You know, and we have those throughout our lives. It might be a moment where you're at the point of despair, and all of a sudden you're praying, and all of a sudden you just feel invaded by energy, by God's presence. You just feel the invasion of His peace. You feel a joy out of nowhere, and then all of a sudden. You're, what's brought to you is maybe a story from the scriptures that's brought to your memory. Or maybe a visitation of someone profoundly holy that says something that is just so right on that it, it just it just wakens you up and kind of zaps you with the ability to continue. We have these many theophanies. They happen. You know? For a woman, it may happen, you know, in labor, delivery. It may happen, you know the passage of seeing a, a child through a health issue or, or getting through a dangerous episode. It may happen for each of us as we're encountering perhaps a life-threatening illness or the potential loss of a loved one or a parent. It could happen through just the challenge of, of finding, you know, new work, new stability, a place to live. You know, that one check that needs to come in to keep your boat afloat. You know, and all these I look at, I call them mini theophanies, little manifestations of God, where God says here, or, you know, and God's help comes. And sometimes it's an actual experience where some people have encountered the visible presence of Christ, mm -hmm. you know. You know, there have been people in Indonesia who have embraced the gospel because Jesus himself appeared to them as light, you know. So never... Never give it, never say never. You know, God will sustain us during our sojourn on earth. I feel like I'm doing all the talking today. Gosh, I need some help. There's a teacher. Where's Father John go? <laughs> He's got company. I'm going to say, keep on it. He has company. That's good. Okay, but, um, you know, we have uh, many appearances of God. Can you give an example of these many theophanies in your own life where God has come through and revealed himself to you? It doesn't have to be an actual appearance where he comes before Paul and says, Paul, I'm Jesus. <laughs> Hello. 
<laughs> you know, but it happens. Can you think of the theophanies that have happened in your life? Twice. Twice. When my son died, when my daughter died. If he hadn't been standing there holding me up, I would have fallen flat on my face. Okay. And you knew it was him. And I knew it was him. Okay. Because I could feel the joy and the light. Okay. And a calmness that just seemed to... Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. I mean, I... I'm having trouble trying to get the right right words out. I think you've explain. done very well. Very well. Wow. Others, many the obvious. David, how about you? Has God ever revealed himself to you? Okay. When and how? Um, in Guatemala, the orphanage. Guatemala, the orphanage down there. Uh, what's the name of the org of orphanage? Hogar? Um, Hogar Raphael. Hogar Raphael mm -hmm. orphanage, okay. And, and how... How did he reveal himself with the orphanage? Um, the little girl. The little girl, huh? Uh, did she say something or just uh, per? Um, just kind of the act. Just, some, just the way everything went. Okay, everything went. Yeah. Uh, your children have a way of doing that, of being conduit by which God kind of reveals himself to us. Okay. Um, when you talk of accident. I'm notorious for being late, and I was late yet again, and as I was driving, I asked God, why Why do I keep doing this? Why can't I just be on time? And in front of me was a, a terrible accident that had just happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they were blocking off the street, and it looked like they're done. It, it was really bad. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like that was, well, that's why. You know, I had just been there a few minutes earlier. I would have been God kept there. you out of harm's way. He mm -hmm. said it's okay for you to be late today, <laughs> right? You know, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Oh, oh yes. Doesn't he? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know, he humbles me so regularly. It's just a part of my diet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Diane? Something has happened. I mean, I suffered for years about something. I had a weight issue for years up and down every time I went up I was down and out every time I went down I was happy and I couldn't understand why I couldn't be happy even though I had gained some weight or whatever and um, I couldn't figure it out because it would really devastate me and uh, the last few days I felt like it just left uh -huh. and it's never left me like that uh -huh. so I feel like it just something happened yeah I don't know what but it just left. Mm -hmm. I'm not upset. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't, you know, stop my life, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, but I don't know. It sounds silly, maybe, but no, that's, it was a big thing in my it's life. It's a very real issue. In a in very real way, it's a God God saying, okay, enough. Yeah, You've been tormented enough with this. I now take it away. Yeah, I suffer so long. And mm -hmm. I, I feel happy now. If I'm 100 pounds overweight, 50 pounds, you know, I'm, I'm going to be happy anyways and go on with my life. I'm going uh -huh. to try to do the right thing, and uh -huh. you know what I mean? Yeah. But I just don't feel like I'm just damned, and I... Well, don't, you know, don't feel bad. The, the psalmist says, he who puts his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. <laughs> <laughs> There's a verse that actually, it's, it's, it's a mistranslation but from another Bible. Uh -huh. Joe. I had a couple. Okay. One was after my friend died. Uh -huh. He came to me in a dream. This was the most vivid dream I've ever had in my life. Uh -huh. I mean, it was like uh, HD. It vivid. Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. and he w had died of cancer, and we were like sitting at like a picnic, and he was whole, and he was young, and he was strong, like when I was a teenager, like oh, when he was in the early twenties. And I went over to him, and I was like, Stephen. Um, I thought you died. He goes, yeah, I did. He says, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I said, well, what's it like? And he goes, well, I can't tell you specifically, but it's good. It's very good. Mm -hmm. well, and I had another one where the nature of my mom's passing she had gotten cancer and then eventually committed suicide from her suffering from cancer. Mm -hmm. And I was extremely angry with God. I mean, I'm not proud of this, but I'm just trying to give you my mindset. 
I f bombs, everything, insulting, vicious things I was saying at him because I felt like I believed that I was angry mm -hmm. that he let it happen. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of my tirade, I said, "Be at peace. She's with me." Now, that's not a phrase I ever said in my life before or since. That was put in there. And I believe that was put in there by God. Mm -hmm. So I also believe that sometimes, like you were saying, where it's not going to be like God talking to you is not going to be this big beam of light like in the movies. Sometimes it could even be in your own voice. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you usually know your character and what you were going to say. And that was not in my mind at all, that phrase. Mm -hmm. So I felt that God had put that into me to let me know that things were all right with her. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else want to share anything? Yeah, I don't expect everybody to have a story, but... But I think we all can identify with the many theophanies that God sends us. And, you know, it could be the feeling of God's profound presence when we encounter Him in prayer or in spiritual reading. Sometimes it may happen for me when I, when I read the scripture, I'll read something and all of a sudden something will just jump out at me. And it'll be so wonderful, a whole deep level of teaching or understanding that I didn't know before. You know, it just wasn't part of my experience, and all of a sudden it's there. And it's the very truth that needed to debunk a false belief out of my thinking. And set me free to a different level of freedom in Christ. And that's what Christ has done, is to these theologies, he's come to set us free. He wants us to be free. Now, um, it also could be in miracles. Have you encountered miracles? Mm -hmm. okay. Miracles? Miracles? As a child, there was a girl in our church, and, and she had zero, the doctor had said there's zero percent chance, for, I don't know how they figure out chances, mm -hmm. there was just no chance of recovery, and, uh, and we were just all praying for her to go peacefully, mm -hmm. she fully recovered. Mm -hmm. So, so what did the doctors say? When, <laughs> I, I honestly, I was little, so I, I didn't know the details, but okay. I just knew that we were praying for her to go peacefully, and we were sad for her. Mm -hmm. And then, my, you know, then the parents explained to us, well, there's been a miracle. Mm -hmm. She's, she's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Miracles happen. You know, we may have issues, and we may feel like they're overwhelming, but God may determine to do something. You know, when we're not, when we're least expecting it. Just through the simple hearing of His Word, and you know, that His Word can convey healing. You know, God does so many marvelous things. Father, yes. Mm -hmm. Does the miracles happen for our salvation? Why God allows miracles to happen for our salvation? Well, that's a whole, that's a whole, whole topic. You can, you can come as a whole <laughs> evening. There's so many things that He accomplishes the miracles. He draw, He draws us to deeper faith. He gives us more time to repent. Um, he does it to to increase the faith of others or to bring them to Him. You know, there's so many things that, that are accomplished through them. We also feel these theophanies in the divine help we receive from others. Can you think of the help you received from someone when you needed it the very most and you knew it was God that had sent them? Huh? Marie, you know that. Yeah, at the time my house was being offered to us, mm -hmm. there was not a penny to be had. Uh -oh. uh, and all of a sudden, my friend who was sitting with me at the table was offering me uh, the money that I would have needed to be able to put a down payment. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow. <laughs> Even they said it because they know I'm religious. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, they all said, wow, Maria. And, and before I know it, the other thousand came up, so I was set, ready to go and give the money for the house. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that happens. You and know. of course, I praised God because they know me. I, I, I just didn't expect it in that manner. <laughs> We're mm -hmm. discussing it, and he yeah. suddenly produced it. And sometimes you may be in need of something, and all of a sudden help comes from everywhere. And you're overwhelmed. Oh my gosh. You know, I'd never anticipated that it would come from so many different sources. And we're just overwhelmed. Oh, when I moved, I got help from everyone, even the Circle K cashier. 
I went to get like some stuff, and he was like, I mentioned I was moving. They go, oh, here, take these bags for garbage bags. I need a garbage bag. Okay. <laughs> like, like, everyone that I encountered literally, like, asked how I was, and somehow came up and helped me with, in some way, shape, or form with my move. Wow. And now I have silverware also, which is a plus. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I want to at least say where Brandon's favorite. He, he hasn't lived like a caveman. This is not the first time he's had silverware. <laughs> We're really happy that I'm glad we all know that. <laughs> I hope so. I thought it went without saying so. Okay, okay. Okay. And you know, you know, someone said, you know, when I take communion, he turns the sacraments, I feel his presence. Have you ever had an experience of when you taking communion and something overcame you? I have. Okay. What did you experience? A, a joy, a peace, uh -huh. a comforting. Mm -hmm. You know, they say if you're going to make a huge decision in life, you should take communion first. Uh -huh. Confession, communion, then some some quiet time, then you go by yourself and just... Because you have, you know, the profound presence of Christ in you. And it's the best time, you know, to ponder those important decisions in life. You know, that's something we need to think about. Communion is a great aid to decision making, to choices that we make. Continue. Okay, so we receive help constantly through others. And so God is constantly working. Miracles, divine help that we receive from us. When we encounter his prov providential protection, protecting us from accidents, as in this case, and many others, where he's delivered us from harm, where there's something that maybe you would have eaten that would have been poisonous. But somehow you were prevented, or maybe you ate something that was poisonous, but it didn't harm you because God protected you in some way mysteriously. And uh, so, simply put, simply put, what is the source of our joy? Okay, okay, God, God. And what action of God fills us with joy? What action of God? His love. His love, encountering His divine love. Love gives birth to joy. When you feel God's love, you're happy. You're joyful. And that's all that's important. You can be an orphan. You can be alone and have nothing else. But if God is present, you have joy. You have joy. So there is nothing more marvelous than experiencing God's love. There's nothing more necessary. And yet, He already loves you. So the only thing that I have to do as a priest is work to get the, the garbage and the other stuff that clutters the path between God's love and you. And yet you need to help me do that, okay? We need to do that together. The priest needs to do that, too, in his personal life. Right, honey? <laughs> yeah. I know, I, I, know you can, I can always count on her. <laughs> she will deliver. Okay. okay. There's nothing more marvelous than experiencing God's love. That's why you had, you had to get married. That's right. <laughs> Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So what would cause our attempt to live good lives somehow be empty or vain? What would cause our attempt to live good lives be empty or make it empty or vain? What would, what would negate them? Seeking our own, uh, you know, seeking for ourselves rather than for God. Okay, okay. What else? What would our attempt to live good be kind of vain or empty? What would cause, what would negate trying to live? Well, I think of that Bible verse where it talks about all these virtues, but it says without love it's nothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. no it's you know okay. First Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, the love chapter, First Corinthians chapter twelve, right? Okay. A noisy symbol. Okay. Mm -hmm. The love chapter. So, I think sometimes if you know some people just try to be good themselves. And they try to do it through their own effort. And they don't really enlist God's help in this process. They just try to 
kind of rough their way through it. And so what happens is, is their actions become kind of empty or vain because they're not asking or receiving any of God's help. Um, but why is it necessary to get God's help? Why is it necessary to get divine help or intervention? Why? Steve, what do you think? Because if you get him to help you, you have to get the glory to him, and it's not of your own. Okay. Okay, true. And the scriptures say you can do no. You can do what without me? Nothing. Nothing without me. John 15, 5. You can do no good thing without me. Okay? That's why we're frustrated. We try to do the good thing. We can't do it. So we're not asking for help. You know, because remember, we were we were created for for God for God's workmanship. He, you know, and He does the good through us, but we have to allow Him to help us. But Father, you know, I you know, I can be kind and sensitive to another person. Well, yes, you can, but you're not aware that it's because God has illumined you to the act of kindness, and it's that you know, reach out and help, and has placed in your heart love for your fellow human being. But if that fellow human being happens to be someone who's wronged you in their hurry, it might be harder to reach out and help. You may need God's help to do that. Okay? So we really need God's help. So you, the key thing is you can't do this alone. You can't do this good thing alone. You never could. And that's why people get frustrated when they try to live the good life. They kind of give up because they're trying to do it alone. They're not looking or seeking for help. And we all need help. And, you know, we, you know it's, uh, it's one of the hardest things. It's one of the hardest things for many Christians to learn is to lean on God for all things. You need to constantly lean on God for everything. And that really is the key and the mystery of the saints is that they... They weren't afraid to ask for constant help. Little things that you and I would kind of just chuckle at. Well, why would you need to ask for that? You know, you can just do that yourself. I mean, the Lord, you know, bless me, Lord. Give me the strength to, to do the task of taking out the trash. Today. Yeah. You know, and he said, well, why, why would I do that? Because my wife knows that I need more help. <laughs> I'm, not getting, I'm not seeking enough of God's help to come with that task. Guess what? He left it and put it out. <laughs> you know, I, I have this thing with trash. You know. When I was a little boy, um, I used to uh, put the trash cans on top of each other so I could climb them and look over the fence at the garbage man as he was coming. It was one of my highlights as a kid. And, you know, see that we miss the simple joys of childhood when, when playing with trash cans could suffice. Aaron, why are you laughing? Okay. 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 It just brought up bad memories. <laughs> okay, memories, okay. Taking out the trash. Okay. Well, you all have memories from childhood, right? You're probably too embarrassed to share. So your priest will do it for you. He'll open a pathway so that you can explore that yourself. And you all will chuckle underneath your breath because you will identify in some way with your childhood and your mentoring as you grew up. Okay. So, um, so you can't do it alone. One of the hardest things for many Christians is learning to lean on God for all things. Now, why is this so? Why is it hard to lean on God for all things? What, why do we have a trouble doing it? Pride. 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 Ego. Pride. Ego, okay. Pride. Okay. Yeah. It might not okay. be what we want. Okay. We you know, you know and, and really, it could be as simple as, as we are conditioned as Americans to be that way. We're to be self-reliant, we're to be independent, we're to be responsible for taking care of ourselves. And yet, that's the opposite of what Orthodoxy teaches. So is, is, Orthodoxy says that we're community. Now, does that mean we're communists? <laughs> okay. Well, no, because communism is a, is, is a godless system. But if you were to put God in there, then would be pretty close to the church. You know, you know, and because remember, the early disciples, they shared all things in common. You know, but yet nobody was lacking. Everybody had what was necessary. And, uh, and so this, now you have the whole argument, okay, socialism versus capitalism. 
versus uh, you know communism and and all kinds of tinkering. And the only thing, the only problem with all these systems on Earth is that greed and pride destroys all of them. Yeah. 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 But you know, a, a, a Greek theologian, uh, Christos Yananas, said the only system that will prevail on Earth is democratic capitalism, because the only thing is the only system that satisfies the lust of man. Just food for thought. Okay. okay. And I'm not anti-American. Okay. I, love, I love our nation. But I love God above our nation. Okay. Well, that's how it should be. Okay. Rise for closing prayer. Uh -huh. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for granting this, e this evening. Thank you, Lord, for bringing each soul here present to contribute to what occurred here this evening. We, Lord, Lord, I ask that you would reach to, to each of them and help them with their individual, personal struggles. Help them, Lord, to experience your deeper love and presence. Help them, Lord, to be successful in their prayer lives. Help them, Lord, to be successful in their battle with their passions. Lord, help them not to be disturbed by despair or dejection. Fill them, Lord, with hope and love. Help them, Lord, to palpably feel and experience your loving presence. I ask this in your blessed name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.